Hello, everyone. And thank you so much for coming uh, to this event. It will be a slightly uh, different open curator talk as us than usual, because uh, I think that uh, almost everyone here uh, already knows uh, many aspects of this project and this exhibition. So please, uh, also, uh, whenever you have some questions or comments, uh, please ask them immediately, because uh, after all, this is a friendly event and it is nice to see so many um, people who help with this project here as well. So this exhibition here, Ornament and Baltic Modern Design, it is a, a, a part of a project that I was working on in, at the Vilnius University uh, from 2018 until 2020 now. And this is actually a second part of an exhibition that was um, uh, starting at the uh, Estonian Museum of Applied Arts and Design. And originally, uh, the second part of the exhibition, so this one, uh, was supposed to happen also at springtime and in Vilnius. But due to sad circumstances, uh, uh, this exhibition had to be reworked quite uh, quickly. However, I am very happy for the fact that thanks to or because of this um, uh, pandemic, this exhibition is now kind of happening in a, um, a symbolic place uh, for this topic, which is the Kaunas uh, County Public Library, finished, at, um, finished in 1987. So it is actually very relevant to this topic here as well. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, everyone who contributed to this exhibition. So first of all, I am very happy that Laura helped me. And Laura was uh, uh, very helpful with everything. It was her idea to have it in this wonderful space. And also, even though Laura did not get credit as a spatial designer, it was her idea to uh, put together this uh, corner which was an excellent idea, so thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I am also very grateful uh, to my supervisor, Virginia Juraniene, for helping me. And uh, uh, at the same time, of course, thank you for the entire Vilnius University. And importantly, thank you for the Lithuanian Council of Research for uh, funding this project. And in um, addition, <laughs> additionally, I would also like to thank uh, Arman Toyan for helping me with uh, uh, both with emotional support and with muscle, carrying things and all sorts of other things, whatever you were needed. Thank you to Carolina for, uh, for advice during the uh, putting together exhibition and for the project. And thank you, Thomas and Thomas, for being here. And <laughs> and also, of course, thank you to people who are, uh, who are sadly not here. The three museums whose uh, objects you see here on these photos. So the... Um, uh, Lithuanian uh, National Museum of Art, Latvian uh, National Art Museum, and the Estonian Museum of Applied Arts and Design, who were extremely helpful with uh, helping me select objects uh, for this exhibition, and of course uh, letting me access the wonderful photos, which are actually done previously for different occasions, as due to the uh, quick time frame of this exhibition, uh, we actually managed to avoid uh, doing any kind of additional photos. So I'm very grateful to the three museums. And also thank you to the Est Estonians, Latvias and Lithuanians National Archives and, uh, um, and the graphic designer of uh, this wonderful exhibition. And uh, first of all, uh, this... Um, this exhibition, it is, um, uh, it is my own choice uh, uh, 
to kind of avoid any kind of um, uh, chronological uh, hierarchy amongst these objects, as the aim is to show uh, the style itself, not as it evolved during time, but kind of as moments uh, uh, throughout uh, the time period here, 1955 until 1985. Even though, actually, uh, a careful uh, viewer might actually see that there is one, one object here which uh, kind of uh, um, is the old one out, as it's actually made in 1953. Mm -hmm. uh, this one here uh, was Vitamicius's was, uh, 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 apple blossom. Which, uh, which is a remarkable object uh, in a way that uh, uh, I don't think most people would believe that it's made at such an early date as it is. It's quite unbelievable that uh, this is the same year as Stalin died and the same year that Lithuania Stylus Combinatas actually complete, made an object as wonderful as this one. So this one, if later someone notices that, no, this is 1953, you will know that this is because uh, emotionally for, and stylistically for me, this object belongs to the later period of time, which is uh, um, uh, which is quite interesting. And um, otherwise, um, uh, the aim of this exhibition is to show uh, different types of uh, mediums. So this is why you see different uh, materials, different uh, uh, types of objects uh, uh, next to each other. Uh, the focus was on objects that you would um, uh, see in an everyday setting, which is a reason why uh, the location of uh, this exhibition is particularly interesting because you see here many of the same elements that would have been in the same setting for which these uh, objects were completed. Uh, you recognize a typical Soviet elevator uh, in the corner there. Uh, you see here a uh, table, some chairs, so everything that you would have actually seen in, uh, side by side with these uh, objects. And I believe that it is for this reason that this location really speaks for um, uh, speaks for the topic uh, itself, as um, it um, it highlights uh, the kind of stylistic and historical context in which these objects were actually created. And uh, for this reason, that these are different materials, I also avoided. Um, uh, grouping them uh, in chronological or ma material ways, as the main emphasis of this exhibition is still on the ornament. That you will see the same uh, ornaments appearing on different types of objects, uh, from textiles uh, to, uh, to ceramics, to porcelain, uh, and also to glass. And uh, 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 additionally, another uh, uh, conscious choice is that when you look around, you will also see that uh, <laughs> uh, well, you will also see that there are um, different uh, um, uh, modes of production that are. Uh, um, uh, that are here at this exhibition. Uh, so some of these objects are actually made uh, in large quantities, whereas some of them are actually applied arts objects. And this is another uh, choice which was made due to the fact that um, um, in reality, during those times, applied arts were also made to serve as an example uh, for the industry. But even though nowadays we make a more conscious uh, uh, differentiation between something that is made as an art object and something that is made as a design object uh, for mass production, during those times, a lot of these objects which were actually made um, as one-off objects were made so that uh, one day they could be produced in larger quantities. 
And it was only the fault of the industry why they couldn't actually be produced in such large quantities. Or, as many of you know, a lot of those objects actually went to the mass production, but they uh, ended up in a very different uh, shape. Sometimes their material was changed, uh, and their quality was um, uh, very different to the one uh, of the original object. The decision why this exhibition should um, uh, start in 1955 is due to the fact that um, this was the uh, year when uh, Baltic modernism can be seen as, um, uh, as starting in Soviet Union. Um, of course, Baltic countries were different from the rest of the Soviet Union in the sense that we had a, a very different, unique, uh, modern style already uh, during the First um, uh, Republic up to the annexation by the Soviet Union, uh, after which um, the production quality was very different. Um, as most of you know, uh, all local factories were nationalized, and um, uh, local design uh, in itself was um, almost um, ob obliterated. So, uh, for example, uh, Estonian glass factory Tarpe glass, of which you see many lovely examples here, uh, they um, uh, had employed several designers already uh, during the First Republic when it was called Loro glass factory. But then, uh, after nationalization, uh, the local glass blowers were uh, forced to work with um, um, uh, molds that were actually brought in from Moscow and uh, Leningrad. And they were the ones that had been discarded there, so not considered good enough for production uh, in the metropolises. And it was only in 1955, so again, the same year, 1955, uh, when the first um, Estonian uh, designer was actually employed by Tarpe Glass, and when they actually started again producing objects that were uh, made for local consumption, not only the same uh, kind of Stalinist, historicist, uh, uh, very heavy looking objects that had been made for uh, the uh, all Soviet production. And the reason uh, why, after Stalin's death, uh, the heavy ornamental style was abolished uh, was very much um, uh, an economical one, much as for uh, much as uh, a cultural one. So, for cultural reasons, of course. Soviet consumer was able to access more and more um, information abroad and they wanted to see the same kinds of objects that they knew were produced elsewhere. But for economic reasons, the heavy Stalinist style was much too difficult to be produced in larger quantities. It was also um, time consuming and uh, all in all it was considered impractical to be uh, producing uh, Stalinist objects in uh, such large quantities. And this is where, uh, afterwards, when you read here the texts, which are kind of hidden away at this moment so that you can see the objects instead of texts, then you can uh, uh, also see the reference to uh, Adolf Loos, whose ideas in 1910 uh, had, uh, star, uh, had contributed to a similar movement uh, in the West as happened uh, with Khrushchev uh, and a new generation of architects and designers uh, in the Soviet Union um, almost 50 years later. And thus, um, uh, very quickly after Stalin's death, uh, ornament and Stalinist style were con uh, considered to be bourgeois um, and uh, Instead, modernism was being propagated. However, it is uh, interesting that even though uh, nowadays, when we think about modernism, then um, uh, perhaps the image that uh, our mind conjures uh, is one of white, plain surfaces, one of very 
uh, strict uh, modern uh, look that uh, where uh, ornament perhaps does not have, have its space in our mind, then uh, this exhibition here shows that actually in, in Baltic states there was a particular interesting style of ornament, which was uh, in parts, it was um, uh, due to different economic reasons. For example, uh, when we talk about glass, then outside you see, uh, uh, I apologize, a glass specialist, glass is always my go-to. <laughs> This is why you see some Estonian glass objects here, my personal favorites, and this is why probably I will reference glass uh, at least uh, a few times more, even if I can't, even if I try to help it. <laughs> but, um, for example, with glass, it is very difficult to uh, produce uh, this kind of minimal, completely plain surface, and this is where cuttings and different ornaments were especially helpful because this is how you can hide away the unevenness of the surface. And it is also similar with many other materials here as well, that in fact it is very difficult uh, to make uh, an object that is completely plain and, uh, and completely even in its surface. And sometimes ornament was needed so that it, it could be uh, a bit hidden away, if we may say so. Additionally, uh, using ornaments was also a very helpful way how to actually diversify production. As um, in Soviet factories, uh, of course, pretty much everything that was uh, uh, produced was also bought, uh, because there was a constant def deficit of objects, which meant that the uh, factories had less of an incentive to keep producing different items uh, than, for example, in a capitalist uh, situation where different uh, uh, factories are competing against one another. However, still, the uh, public needed some kind of diversification of different objects. And this is where ornament again became very helpful as this way, because in Soviet situation, uh, usually buying different machinery uh, was more expensive than making someone do everything by hand, which was why in Soviet situation, a lot of um, objects were uh, produced by hand, even if they were mass produced. For example, uh, Taile Combinatas and Dars in Tallinn, that, uh, uh, even though they were actually mass production, they were working uh, almost as if handicrafts and, and uh, uh, producing by hand the same objects over and over again. And this way, it also made it a lot more easier uh, to diversify ornament. That you already had the molds, for example, in place. Uh, however, uh, adding a different ornament to it was mostly just a question of um, uh, the person who was painting it, uh, making a slightly different line uh, or dots or something different to it. So this was why ornament was very uh, helpful. Uh, there were different arguments about the situation of ornament uh, in Soviet situation from the very beginning. And also, I would like to direct your attention that there on the table you see some, uh, some small labels and on those you can find QR codes. That uh, I did not uh, put too many texts here, but if you would like to read up more on, on this topic, then there you can actually find some archival sources, some, uh, some shorter information on the topic itself, uh, uh, whether by smartphone or uh, uh, or accessing with your computer. And uh, during Stalinist uh, period, the, uh, the kind of um, uh, two main um, types of ornament that were allowed were either neo-historical ornament, so referring to classical sources, and or uh, national ornament, uh, referring to one's national past. 
This, of course, was very much a propagandistic reason as Soviet Union had to show that uh, uh, in the Soviet context, uh, uh, the countries that were annexed had actually their own uh, national freedom and people were free to cultivate their cultures as they did before. Uh, so for this reason, a lot of Baltic designers as well turned to uh, national ornament as it was a way of um, avoiding the kind of heavy uh, neo-historical ornament with the uh, that was referring to Greece, uh, um, ancient Greece, uh, uh, but which was foreign to uh, our context. And this is one type of ornament that is um, actually very present in this um, exhibition as well. For example, uh, outside you saw the lovely uh, vase by Natalia Mentele, the one with the dancing figures. So you see here that, for example, the um, this type of national ornament, it uh, remained, but at the same time it was um, uh, modernized so that the ornament itself became much more contemporary looking in its, um, in its uh, look. And um, uh, one exhibition on, on which you can read up more online uh, was the 1955 uh, uh, Baltic uh, Applied Arts Exhibition. And it is very interesting that especially um, during a conference that took place during that um, exhibition, uh, ornament especially was a very relevant um, uh, topic. There were several arguments uh, what exactly should be the place of ornament in, um, in Soviet uh, modern design. And uh, whether it should be uh, encouraged or whether it uh, should be avoided. And most of the local specialists actually agreed that the uh, ornament was a very vital way of um, uh, showing them kind of local identity, how to uh, uh, differentiate the uh, local design from the international one. As, in of, co as of course in 1955 it was still very much a question of uh, how exactly are we going to invent the Soviet modernism while at the same time avoiding uh, overt uh, um, uh, I apologize, occasionally my English fails me, overt uh, um, suggestions of uh, international modernism and thus for that reason ornament became a very vital uh, idea as it helped to show that yes in the West we have the, they have this um, evil uh, soulless international modernism with no ornament but here in the, in the Soviet Union we have this uh, friendly national ornament uh, with flowers and everything which helps us to uh, create uh, our own unique style which is not international but local and it was also during that very same exhibition that um, different types of ideas were set up uh, uh, which influence, uh, influenced heavily local production that um, after that uh, um, uh, Baltic countries uh, um, got um, uh, a greater sense of freedom in um, uh, using their own local materials and using their own local ma uh, designers as well. Additionally, as the exhibition was a collaborative project between the three Baltic states, um, after that also there were some uh, different um, uh, facts that arose, uh, uh, which brought collaboration between the three Baltic countries. For example, the fact that uh, uh, there were no uh, because, well, all three Baltic countries are relatively small in their population, which meant that, for example, when it comes to more specialized fields of art and design, it was not uh, really financially viable 
to, uh, to start the local education of all of these fields. So for that reason, for example, Estonian um, um, uh, State Institute of Art uh, became uh, uh, nowadays one might even say international education uh, institute that uh, there were not only Estonian students, but there were also uh, certain fields where uh, there were Russian-speaking programs where also Latvian, Lithuanian and Moldovan students were admitted. So, for example, jewelry was one of them. Uh, and outside you can also see two, uh, uh, two images with uh, silver jewelry from two countries. Uh, for example, with Lithuanian designers, studying in Estonia uh, was so popular that when in 1988 there was the first Lithuanian jewelry exhibition, there were 13 um, uh, designers um, uh, present there, and out of them, nine had uh, trained in Tallinn. So this shows how. Um, how important these kinds of collaborations were. Um, and um, of course, these types of um, meetings also uh, reinforced the contact between the three countries. Uh, that the three states were in a similar position, which meant that there was some um, always kind of a looking towards each other to see uh, how the other states were coping and how to um, how to bring that to one's own context, so to speak. Uh, for example, as Carolina has written about Vella Asis and uh, Talas Paginskas' uh, uh, friendship, how they themselves collaborated um, with, uh, amongst the, uh, uh, sorry, in questions of interior design. And additionally, for example, Felix, Felix, uh, Felix Astaugantas and uh, um, uh, ben, uh, Bruno Thunberg in Estonia uh, were the two founders of um, uh, respective um, industrial art departments in two countries. Uh, in Estonia, Sorry, in Lithuania it happened a few years earlier. However, uh, the two grand masters of design were in constant um, uh, contact. How exactly should they um, come about those uh, programs and how to um, and how to organize them? So, as, uh, as mentioned, uh, an important element uh, was different institutional contacts. Amongst them, universities uh, were one key uh, object, one, were one key um, factor. However, uh, there were also, uh, for example, contacts between um, uh, different uh, artist unions of the three uh, states and the, uh, and the state art funds. As I already mentioned, the uh, Applied Arts Exhibition of 1955 which uh, uh, was extraordinary in the sense of uh, uh, the manifesto that was uh, produced as a, as a result, which brought on this kind of tendency towards a more modern style. However, in reality, these applied arts exhibitions of Baltic states were happening uh, uh, pretty much regularly, every two or three years, depending on the time, uh, up to um, in reality, up to nowadays, when uh, when the applied Austrian analysis are still going on in, uh, between the three countries, and um, I am not going to go too much into detail uh, about different organizations such as uh, media and uh, others, as. Uh, it would make it far too uh, long, and I believe that uh, many of you already know these uh, topics. And those of you who do not know yet, please feel free to check the QR code. Um, uh, reality is also that, um, in many ways, um, uh, uh, the Baltic modern style, it, it was not so much uh, initiated as a conscious uh, 
decision to try to emulate one another, but it was rather a, um, a result of a, a similar mindset, so to speak, that uh, all three countries were uh, very much um, positioning themselves towards the West. There were, uh, in all three countries, there were slightly different elements. For example, for Lithuanians, the, um, uh, the proximity to Poland, uh, which had a very unique modern style, was uh, extraordinarily crucial. Uh, whereas for Estonians, it was, of course, uh, uh, Finland and the ability to see Finnish television, which uh, kind of contributed to this uh, uh, love of modernism in the local context. However, uh, in all of, uh, from all of those perspectives, um, it was still very much a question of wanting to belong to the West, uh, so to speak. And uh, additionally, we already spoke about the um, wish to uh, show Soviet Union as a kind of a, uh, multi, voluntarily multicultural uh, context in, in a stylistic way. And now Baltic modernism was actually in a way contributing to the same idea as it helped Soviet Union to show that the, uh, as, uh, to show Soviet Union as a kind of a, uh, contemporary looking uh, uh, contemporary looking uh, uh, society. So even though it was, uh, uh, it might have not been so uh, openly encouraged by the Soviet Union or started by it, this is the reason why it was tolerated and why, for some re uh, why in certain contexts, Baltic modernism was also exported to other places. For example, uh, the um, uh, the case of Lithuanian experimental furniture factory designing uh, uh, furniture for a hotel in Guinea, and the Estonian architects working in Tashkent, for example, to kind of export this idea of modernism elsewhere as well, as it was widely um, widely recognized that Baltic uh, countries were um, uh, excelling in in this kind of medium. Additionally. Baltic uh, design was also uh, supported. Um, uh, apologies, no, uh, was also praised towards uh, throughout uh, um, different all Soviet uh, exhibitions and also uh, at the meetings of art councils. Uh, art council as a phenomenon is actually one of the things that I would say contributed very greatly to the um, idea of uh, Baltic modern style as an art council was in reality a group of um, elected professionals of a, a specific field uh, who then uh, congregated once a month or, uh, or more or less frequently depending on the specific type of um, uh, factory or medium and they then um, evaluated designs according to their practicality, their aesthetic appearance, on all, all sorts of other um, um, qualities. And for that reason, uh, local uh, design was kept at a relatively high level, as there were also pro always professionals uh, uh, deciding uh, uh, what was good or what not, so to speak. But at the same time, in certain fields, it also brought this um, um, uh, kind of reproduction of modernism, that everyone knew what kind of objects were good objects. So this sort of very modern idea in itself, that nowadays it might seem strange to us, but in reality it was very much uh, uh, in tune with, for example, similar in initiatives that were in Sweden, in UK, where the uh, Art Council was uh, deciding over things like that as well. And one of the, uh, and the highest level of those Art Councils was actually the All-Union Art Council, which was 
nowadays it might seem a bit uh, funny to think that uh, uh, at a point Soviet Union tried to initiate a system where all objects that were designed would also be evaluated uh, by an all-Soviet uh, council uh, to make sure that uh, everything would be at a good modern quality, uh, modern level throughout the Soviet Union in reality. Actually, these types of uh, uh, art council meetings turned more into kind of art exhibitions where people, well, where designers got a chance to visit, say, Tashkent or Tbilisi or other places. They would meet their uh, colleagues there, and uh, all in all, it was, uh, I would dare to say, that quite different from what had originally been. Uh, been uh, invented by the uh, Soviet Union. And it was at those meetings where um, um, Baltic designers usually received the highest uh, honors, almost the highest. Uh, the reality was that the first place always went to a factory that was in Leningrad or Moscow for propagandistic reasons. And then the second and third place usually went to uh, a, a factory in Tallinn, Vilnius, Riga. Uh, for example, when we talk about porcelain, it of course would have been Riga porcelain factory. When we talk about furniture, it would have been uh, Tallinn and Vilnius kind of competing uh, for the second and third uh, place. So it was, uh, I would also argue that art councils uh, were a very vital uh, element of uh, producing this kind of Baltic modern style that they, they themselves also contributed to this kind of uh, uh, um, unique local style which was uh, uh, recognized as modern uh, and which was based on a modern example. Uh, additionally, uh, occasionally, uh, the local designers are also kind of trying to actively um, fool the uh, all Soviet uh, powers. For example, if you look at this uh, wonderful uh, exhibit here, uh, I'm not sure how many of you already saw the title of this uh, piece, but it's called 50 Years of Consumer. <laughs> so th this example is actually uh, uh, intended as a Soviet uh, uh, souvenir, so to speak. That uh, uh, throughout the Soviet Union, different factories actually had to produce some um, items that would either commemorate different all Soviet um, uh, festival states. Uh, uh, such as 50 years of Komsoma, 50 years of Soviet Union, uh, 50 years from Lenin's death, uh, uh, all sorts of other uh, events like that. However, uh, as Baltic modernism was the style that was uh, uh, preferred throughout the, uh, our region here, that meant that the uh, local designers kind of tried to push it as far as they could to see what they could uh, see fit as uh, uh, representing uh, uh, these kinds of um, uh, these kinds of so uh, Soviet propagandistic symbols, which might have seen as very fixed, but in reality there was some uh, some room for play here. For example. Uh, another thing that's sadly not present here, uh, by an Estonian textile designer was, uh, um, well, it was for the same event actually in the 1960s, and he designed a, a fabric that was uh, just different little red stars on a white uh, background. So it actually looked very much like pop art or something very contemporary, but it was the Soviet star, so it all depended on the context where you would uh, represent it. And as I already promised, there would be more class references to come. There, were, there was a uh, very lovely Estonian class um, 
which was kind of very modern looking, uh, completely plain uh, 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 drinking glass. And on it was cut in very kind of stylized way, just the name Lenin. So uh, the cutting was actually so light that you couldn't even see it that well, but it still counted as a, as a souvenir commemorating Lenin. So it's quite interesting in that sense. That very same uh, class I actually found that in the kitchen of the Estonian Applied Arts Museum uh, because it was so um, unnoticeable. No one had actually looked uh, what was there. It was just a mass-produced, rather ugly glass. And then we suddenly see that, oh, look, there's Lenin actually written on it. So, uh, otherwise, the different types of um, well, ornaments that we can see here um, are, uh, for example, what can be seen as quite popular is different references to nature. For example, here you can see uh, a lovely flower pattern on this uh, um, coffee set by Ilga Trebate uh, from Latvia. And, and here as well, um, an Estonian textile example. Additionally, what can be seen quite often is different the types of um, uh, geometric pattern, which are almost like pop art. So, for example, here an example by uh, Riga porcelain factory, again, kind of very modern looking. This, uh, this particular example uh, even looks quite contemporary nowadays. And here we can, uh, here we can see a uh, contemporary look, uh, you can see a pop art inspired uh, piece by uh, Helene Kuman, an Estonian ceramic artist. So here, uh, it is actually a kitchen set which is uh, much bigger in reality uh, and on these uh, tiny jars it says cinnamon and pepper. So these are those kinds of um, pots that are intended for keeping spices and uh, different ingredients. So it's actually a huge set. It would not have uh, looked that impressive as a photo all in all together, but if you if you visit the Estonian Applied Arts Museum, you can see all of them together. <laughs> and um, uh, here as well, you can see some uh, uh, some references to national cultures. So this particular uh, textile here, which you can, uh, which was produced in the um, uh, Kalmas um, silk factory in Kaltinje. It is actually really well hidden, these uh, kind of national references. But it is only when you look at it very close that you can actually recognize these kinds of figures in national costumes. And this one by Mark Humberg in Estonia, it's also a particularly interesting example as on one hand it kind of looks like um, um, some kind of a snowy landscape and on another you once again recognize these kinds of very national, uh, national art inspired figures. Please come and give me. And, uh, and one element that's uh, quite popular, especially in souvenirs, here, here I only have one example of this tendency, is, uh, um, is the local old town. Because old town, especially this kind of historical old town, was something that um, uh, united all three Baltic countries. That all of us have this sort of Western-inspired uh, um, uh, appearance to our old towns. Um, in Tallinn and Riga, of course, more German-inspired. In Lithuania, the Catholic uh, Church, of course, looks slightly different, but still, it is inspired by the uh, by Central European ar uh, architecture. And so here, uh, this is quite interesting that if you look at it, it's made by an Estonian designer, but uh, it could actually be. Uh, if you didn't see that it's Estonian, you could, uh, uh, you could consider it uh, also Old Town in Riga or some mm -hmm. elements of Kaunas or Vilnius as well. So, so this particular one I really like for that reason, that it really shows uh, this kind of uh, um, 
uh, what uh, uh, what perhaps um, uh, stylistically differentiates Baltic states from the rest of the Soviet Union. Uh, Jonas Vikernas' uh, uh, vase that's uh, actually made in 1955. So again, without looking at the date, uh, it would be quite unbelievable that this object was actually designed in 1955 and that Vikernas was actually designing similar objects already in late 1940s. So, uh, especially with those earlier objects here, the three of them, you can really see how um, how inventive the local designers were already early on. This as well, this um, uh, tea set is probably earlier than 1955 as well, but there is no knowledge as to what's the precise date. But you can also see this uh, very lovely um, uh, kind of nationally inspired uh, uh, local motif here as well. As the Soviet Union collapsed, a lot of the factories that you see references here uh, do no longer exist, uh, unfortunately. And for a while, the fate of uh, this style was uh, rather controversial. But I would argue that it's only now that um, uh, these objects are once again becoming uh, appreciated and collected even. Um, for example, one last class reference, uh, reference I promise, uh, <laughs> that uh, after we curated the um, Tarpe glass exhibition, so the glass factor exhibition in Estonia, after that um, there was a huge boom of um, uh, different um, people selling and collecting objects by that glass factory. And I see that also happening in Latvia and Lithuania, that people are more and more appreciating objects that are uh, nowadays rightfully considered uh, works of art and um, a kind of testimonies to local creativity. Thank you. a lot for the exhibition and your interesting talk. What about the Baltic Sea? I am always thinking about uh, do these designers be inspired by the, the sea motifs? Have you mentioned anything? That, that is very interesting that I have not seen that much sea motif. It's, it is actually quite curious. Only amber, but uh, uh, sea as a motif. It's, it's quite curious that I have not seen that uh, actually. I don't think so. Only as backdrops to some old town uh, uh, motifs. So, for example, if you uh, think about those, um, uh, especially in letter art, they are quite common, those albums with views of old town. So sometimes you see some, uh, some bits of sea as well where it's stressed. But it is interesting actually that water as an element does not seem to play in, in this. Yeah, that's a very good. Interesting question. What about the colors? Could you name any very bold color? Have you any thought about? <laughs> uh, blue, I believe. That, yes. Uh, yeah. That blue as a color seems to emerge uh, emerge uh, quite often. Um, and also green, as you see here. Um, Usually, it seems to be relatively bright colors, I would say. That perhaps it is to kind of um, fight against the Soviet monotonous uh, uh, system, uh, in a way. And also, perhaps it is um, um, because um, uh, furniture in itself was usually rather, uh, well, it, furniture is usually made of light wood or something, so it made sense to make those objects that are intended to brighten up the everyday life uh, as bright as possible, uh, so to speak. Uh, because um, that was actually one of the intentions of um, uh, uh, 
uh, apply arts and design in general, that they were meant to be easy ways of making different apartments uh, different from each other, so to speak. That if you had the same kind of uh, furniture produced everywhere, you had the identical chairs, identical tables, then at least you could get different vases on those identical tables, but at least that helped. And this is also a reason why home textiles were so important. That, for example, here as well, you see many different examples of lovely home decoration uh, textiles, which were, um, on one hand, uh, they were something that uh, uh, came from pop art in the 1960s, kind of these uh, brave colors and brave large patterns. Uh, as in textiles, it was easier to play around with different ornaments to make it as big and or small as you wish. And also, uh, one particular um, object that was very popular, especially in Estonia and uh, Latvia, was the uh, kind of um, uh, uh, Ria uh, carpet. So, the special kind of carpet that goes on the wall which was, on one hand, it helped to make uh, uh, interiors more interesting, but at the same time, it also helped when, when your apartment was actually very cold, because then the uh, wall carpet actually helped to block some of the, uh, some of the cold off, that it uh, kind of seemed more, um, seemed warmer. I'm quite sad that I didn't really get any uh, wallpapers here. Because this is actually something that doesn't seem to exist as a collection. I don't know if you've noticed that as well, but it seems like wallpaper is not really collected that much yet. So, yeah. So this is perhaps an interesting challenge. I was uh, quite sad that I couldn't uh, find any examples of that either. Yes. I'm also very interested. It's, it's such a uh, my, um, our topic. That's why many professional questions. But the one yeah. which is quite simple: yeah. uh, when you were researching for like, Latvian, Estonian, and Lithuanian museums, have you um, found that, for example, Lithuanians uh, collected any Estonian items, or vice versa? In Estonia, <laughs> have you found any interesting Lithuanian things, no. or in Riga, any? <laughs> no, only person. In some cases, some, um, for example, um, there were some, uh, especially jewelry design. As if you if you make uh, uh, if a young person moves to a different country for a longer period of time, often they will get married and they will stay there. So, for example, uh, there outside you see uh, this some. Um, Silver jewelry set with a uh, with a kind of labyrinth uh, pattern, cross snake. So this is uh, uh, made by Tiu Vaivatien, and, and she is actually Estonian who married a, a Lithuanian man and then moved to Lithuania with, with him and uh, and it, uh, is working there now. So this is uh, only oh, such example. Yes, okay. but um, um, this is quite interesting that all of our. Uh, national design museums, they seem to be very um, focused on not only our own uh, context, but hopefully this will change, but of course in all three countries it is only uh, very much a work in progress, that so many things to collect and so, <laughs> so a few space as well for, for all of those uh, uh, institutions. Uh, um, that uh, it also seems that, for example, there aren't really that many examples of uh, Russian uh, design either. That there are also only some cases where, for example, Estonian or um, or say Latvian or Lithuanian designers have produced items for. Uh, for a factory somewhere in Russia or uh, Ukraine, for example, but uh, it generally seems to be more of an exception. 
I have watching. Yes. Are you familiar with interior designs? For example, in many apartments, the walls are painted in a single color, but then you can figure out, find out some patterns of shapes, the lines that are scattered all over the place. I would have taken a picture for you, but oh. I <laughs> forgot some. I didn't follow it, so are you familiar with anything like that? No, I'm not. That's very interesting. Thank you. I know. Is, it, is it just a, a fact that happened in the 80s? Maybe or... I, I think it's probably very much a, an 80s thing because it, uh, it's actually that. Um, um, actually, I think that it is probably very much in tune with the kind of do it yourself movement that also, for example, uh, there was an Estonian magazine. Uh, uh, home and uh, uh, art and home that was very much propagating these things how to make your apartment more interesting yourself and there were also similar things in Lithuania and Latvia as well the, those kinds of how to uh, cheaply and easily make things yourself uh, so I think it could probably be that then especially in 1980s I think that probably uh, people were more also uh, able to access uh, things from outside, so they they were also very likely to maybe copy something that they saw in a foreign interior magazine or something like that. That uh, this kind of thing, uh, kind of copying things that you could find uh, uh, with very good results very often was quite popular, as you couldn't uh, really buy anything Western in the shops, and so you had to kind of make do yourself. For example, in Estonian History Museum, there's a very interesting uh, piece, which is a, a black dress, which is actually fashioned after a funeral suit worn by Jackie Kennedy at her husband's funeral. So this was made by a very talented Soviet, uh, Soviet Estonian woman who actually looked at the picture and she uh, crafted the exact same uh, dress just by looking at the picture. So this kind of craft, um, uh, this kind of craft knowledge of uh, how to make do with something when you have al almost nothing, this is quite interesting. Thank you so much everyone for coming. <laughs> and this exhibition is staying open until uh, 6th of September, I believe. So. Is it going to travel somewhere? I have no, no plans yet, but actually I was thinking that it could well do, because I haven't had time to think about it now. But as it's all been produced now, then it would be very easy to... Uh, I was just thinking that it could be very easy to do that in Latvia as well, uh, as it's... Well, now most of the expenses have already been made, so... <laughs> yes, yes. So I'm um, thinking about it, and it could be a very uh, good idea. Because it's, uh, it also doesn't really uh, take that much space uh, either. <laughs> I, oh, I also wanted to say that the wonderful quality of framing has been done by Rema Hotel T here in Kaunas, uh, to whom I am extremely grateful because th this framing really th does look uh, very good. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they also work with. Uh, uh, work, work very operatively and uh, generally were extremely helpful in all sorts of ways. The, print, uh, the prints have also been uh, done by them, so I was very happy with the quality of the print. But it's not the glossy paper, but instead it's the uh, proper kind of uh, mm -hmm. 